Hello uh, and good day everyone. My name is Roni Charlo and I'm the Director of Professional Programs here at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker for our webinar, uh, Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He is the Thomas D. D. Professor of Organizational Behavior uh, and has taught it in the, the Graduate School of Business since 1979. Pfeffer is the author or co-author of 14 books on the topics including Power in Organizations, Managing People, Evidence-Based Management, and the Knowing Doing Gap. His latest book, Leadership BS, Fixing Workplaces and Careers, One Truth at a Time, which we'll be hearing about today, was published in September 2015. Pfeffer is author of more than 150 articles and book chapters and has won numerous awards for his scholarly research, including an honorary doctorate from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Pfeffer has taught seminars in 39 countries and has been a visiting professor at Harvard Business School, London Business School, Singapore Management University, and IESE in Barcelona. Prior to joining Stanford, he was on the faculty at the business schools at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Illinois. He has served as the board of directors of several human capital software companies, as well as other public and private company and nonprofit boards. Uh, so, Definitely very accomplished, and it should be a great pleasure to hear him uh, speak to us today about his latest book, Leadership BS. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be with everybody who's on the webinar. Um, as the contact slide that Ronnie just went by had my contact information on it, I would I'd, I'd, I'd encourage people, if you have questions not answered by the webinar, or if you want to be in touch with me for any other reason, to email me at feff at stanford.edu. Um, and so with that, we'll launch into the content of the webinar, which is about the, this book, which is on the one hand controversial, on the other hand to me, of course, complete common sense. It is a book that is written um, based upon the following observation, and the observation is, on the one hand, we have an enormous, a huge, a gigantic industry of leadership. Uh, for instance, there are more than 2.6 million entries on Google Scholar, which looks, searches just for the scholarly literature, 140 million results from a Google search, 117,000 entries on Amazon.com. The estimates are, uh, McKinsey estimates $14 billion spent uh, annually on training just in the United States. I estimate using ASTD um, data about 20 billion. Uh, Kennedy lecturer Barbara, um, uh, Barbara Kennedy uh, the, estimates $50 billion a year. It's a big industry. Virtually every business school and many other places, of course, have leadership activity as a, uh, as a common part of their thing. However, Notwithstanding that we have spent all this money and have done so for like lots of time, workplaces by every single measure that you can get for by virtually every source are horrible. There are low levels of employee engagement as reported by Gallup. There are low levels of job satisfaction and declining reported by Gallup, by the conference board, by Wright Management, and by Mercer. You can look at the data yourself. Um, no wonder, my favorite statistic, in Parade Magazine, which used to be part of the Sunday Supplement in most newspapers, did a survey in 2012 and found that 35% of U.S. employees said they would willingly forego a substantial pay raise if their direct supervisor would get fired. So that tells you something about the case state of the workplace in spite of all uh, this leadership training. And by the way, it is important to recognize that the Gallup studies and the other studies I have cited, not this parade thing, but everything else, deals for the most part with worldwide surveys. So this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a problem around the world, lots of investment in leadership, bad workplaces. By the way, things aren't so good for the leaders either. Leaders are losing their jobs. CEOs, uh, are you, CEO tenures are declining, have been for a while, is documented by the conference board and consulting firm Booz, but it's worse than that. Um, in a group, a uh, Stanford alumni group, recently got together in Washington, D.C. to uh, discuss my book, and one of the pre-meeting polling questions was, have you been fired? And these are now Stanford people, highly selected, highly motivated, highly intelligent, certainly not a random sample. 60% of them said yes. So, so it is not just an issue of 
you know, you're an Uber driver or losing your job, or it's not just an issue that there's turnover at the top, that there, but there is. These are people throughout the organization who are losing their job in spite of the fact that they have, in many instances, MBAs and other forms of business education. Next measure. So we got leaders losing their jobs. We got workplaces are horrible in the face of all of this big spin. Third thing is go ask the companies. How well are your leadership development efforts going? Are you getting good leaders? Are you producing sufficient leaders? And you have to understand that the people that you're asking are biased to give you a positive answer because, you know, they've actually spent the money. Only 7% of senior managers polled by UK business school thought their firms effectively developed global leaders. An extensive survey found that only 8% of executives felt their company was effective in developing leaders. The Institute for Corporate Productivity reported that even among the best, highest performing companies, 66 reported that they were ineffective at developing leaders and were getting worse. Bill Gentry at the Center for Creative Leadership who has a new book out, by the way, which I highly recommend, who summarized numerous research studies, noted that one half of all leaders and managers are ineffective in their current role. Leaders are failing. Uh, as you know, from 1999 to 2005, about 40% of companies and their leaders got in trouble enough to warrant major press attention. Uh, many Americans believe there's a leadership co uh, uh, co crisis DDI, another global HR consulting firm, reported from a survey that one-third did not consider their own manager effective, and their global leadership forecast noted that by their own admission, leaders are falling short, with leaders consistently giving low marks to the quality of leadership in their own organization. So my conclusion based upon this is that uh, the leadership industry has failed, and if it continues to do what it is doing, it will continue to fail. So then the question is, what are the causes and what might we do about it? The first cause is that if you, anybody listening to this call can go out today and become a leadership expert. There are no requirements. You can't go out today and do back surgery, and you can't go out today and build a bridge or fly an airplane, but you can, in fact, be a leadership expert. Of Inc. Magazine's list of the top leadership experts published in 2014, only four had a doctoral degree, doctorate in a relevant field, one had no degree at all, two had degrees in divinity, which I think is actually important given the Leadership teaching is a lot around um, uh, lay preaching. Um, the five did not have any degrees in business. And if you go to their websites, which I did, the expertise that the experts are telling you is um, talking. Um, so they're, they're, they're great at talking. Whether or not they're great at doing anything, you know, certainly when I had back surgery a couple years ago when you get in a plane, the number one requirement for the pilot or your surgeon is not the ability. I can describe, even I, by the way, I can describe how to do surgery. You wouldn't want me doing it. So, um, so we do have a situation in which many people are delivering material with no qualifications. And then they are able to do that because, of course, the evaluation of most of these leadership programs, well, some aren't evaluated at all. Some that are evaluated are evaluated by the expenditure of resources. How many people went to the program? How many hours? Okay, that's fine. Some of them then are evaluated by what did the people think of the program? And these are sometimes called smiley face sheets or happy sheets where we ask people, did you have a good experience? Um, now, the problem with self-rated experience is that there is another field, it's called education and teaching, in which we know a couple of things. The first thing we know is that student ratings are correlated zero with the objective amount of material that, um, uh, that students learned. And secondly, we know that uh, teacher ratings are highly predicted by 30-second silent videos rated by other people of the teachers. So you say, how can a 30-second silent video of people who will never see this person again predict their teaching ratings at the end of the course? And the answer is, of course, that they are both picking up on the same thing, which is some measure of personality, social dominance, you know, affability, kind of commanding the room, whatever, uh, none of which, by the way, are um, necessarily what we have been talking about, which is employee engagement, success of leaders, et cetera. So, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the field of leadership development, you reward, you get what you reward, as we learned from the quality movement. In the case of this, you reward entertainment, you get entertainment. Few, I know of none, uh, companies assess their interventions in the leadership space by, me by using measures that assess 
the effects of, of leaders on their workplaces, such by employee engagement, job satisfaction, turnover, et cetera. Next, and we're going to come back to this, there are divergent interests between the leaders and those led, and even differences in measures of leader well-being and organizational success. So when I was writing this book, I gave a copy of the manuscript to a friend of mine, very knowledgeable human being who has been a senior partner at Accenture and is now president of Menlo College in Menlo Park, California, and has served on a number of corporate boards. He read the book. He gave me some comments. He said, by the way, based on your book, what should I do to be a better leader? And I said, that's an interesting question. What do you mean by better leader? You know, I said, when Stan O'Neill drove Merrill Lynch into the ground in the 2007 financial crisis, he left with $140 million. If you're Stan and Mrs. O'Neill, he did a pretty good job. If you're one of the Merrill Lynch people and the residue left behind, he didn't do such a good job. And there are many examples like that. So I think what that example illustrates is that we are way, 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 way too sloppy in thinking about leader effectiveness. So you, need, you tell me, is this leader effective or not? We have to specify the criteria. Are we talking about work unit criteria? We talk about organizational level criteria over what time period? And, you know, and even if we measure profit margins versus profit growth, depending upon how you measure the margins and measure the growth, those things aren't going to be correlated, let alone be correlated with how the leader has done for him or herself. So you need to be, I think, very precise about how we measure leader effectiveness and also recognize that what's good for the organization is not good for the leader. You see companies lay off people all the time. It helps their profits, but it doesn't help the people laid off. You see leaders leaving uh, in failed circumstances with, um, uh, with, with huge severance packages, even though they've destroyed the organization. So there is a divergence of interest that we need to pay attention to. There is also an enormous amount of conceptual imprecision about leadership ideas, and this is not just an academic issue. So if I said we're going to improve sanitary practices in medicine, which have been a big problem in which the Institute of Medicine some years ago in a report called Keeping Patients Safe said we're killing about 80 or 100,000 people a year. If I said we're going to improve sanitary practices, we would say what are the sanitary practices, how will we measure their occurrence, so that we can actually then go and see how much of it are being done, and if we use interventions, we can measure improvement. If I say we are going to have more authentic leadership, we've got a big problem, because as I've gone on the web, there's no definition, there's no precision about or consensus about how to measure authentic leadership, or decide whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, nobody knows how to measure it. If, you do not, if there's not consensus on measurement, if we don't know what hand washing means in the case of uh, you know, medicine, we cannot improve it. And that's the case here. So conceptual imprecision about, and we, and we talk about these things in very sloppy ways, makes it hard to focus both programs to make it better and assessments of whether or not those programs have worked. This is simple common sense. So there are some remedies obviously suggested implicitly in what we've talked about thus far. One, we ought to measure outcomes. I mean, any leadership program that only gives out smiley face sheets I don't think is doing the right thing because you've got to measure outcome. Over some time period, I understand it's difficult, but you need to measure satisfaction, engagement, bullying, turnover, the number of professional, um, the number of potential successors, uh, leadership uh, success in their jobs, do the people they, do, the, do, the, do the people being led like the leaders, a bunch of things like that. And of course, we need to select scientists, not entertainers, uh, to do the work of leadership evaluation and, I would argue, leadership development. Um, we need to acknowledge the conflict of, of objectives and then work to understand where they come from and how they might be reduced. Instead of just laughing at the story of Stan O'Neill leaving with $140 million as Merrill Lynch goes into the toilet, or Carly Fiorina leaving with $50 million and then going to run for president on our business record, a pretty spotty business record. Um, we need to understand how this, is, how this is possible. Now, in banking, after the financial crisis, there has been more attention to this, and they've got this idea of clawbacks 
So if I make a lot of money under false pretenses and then it, the company falls apart, I get to have try to get you to repay some of that money. But I, this is not a talk on incentive alignment, but incentives I think are, are, are really critical and in many instances the incentives are not aligned. Uh, the, 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 the senior executive incentives are very often way too short term uh, and way too, um, way too focused on things that can be gamed. Uh, including obviously stock price, which is gained all the time. If you don't believe that, just go back and look at the history of the famous Enron. I mean, you know, um, they gave uh, people stock options that paid off, so the stock got to a high price, unfortunately, for a very, very short period of time. So we need to do something to align incentives way better. Um, here's another problem that I think we all face. So the number one word probably not the number one word, it's one of the common words. The number one word that is used about me and my books and my fortune blogs, I do blog on fortune.com, I have a column about twice a month, um, is that it's dark or that it's depressing or that it's I don't know what. So the opposite of dark or depressing, of course, is inspiring. And the leadership world loves inspiration. So I gave a talk at the Valeric Business School and was going to use an example from that talk in my book. And so I said I better make sure I spell Valeric correctly. So I went to the Valeric Business School, which is a very good business school in Belgium's website. And the first thing on their website is looking for an inspiring management course. Australian Graduate School of Management's website notes that the school creates inspirational learning opportunities. So you, you guys spend some time on some websites of engineering schools, law schools, medical schools. They will talk about, or even in, you know, uh, they will talk about uh, material that is professionally relevant, that is scientifically rigorous, that is well delivered, that it is available online and through various learning modalities. But I don't see many people going to medical school to be inspired <laughs> or to law school to be inspired. They're, they're going to medical school and law school to be educated in professionally relevant knowledge that they are then going to be able to use in a substantive way. And so I think our search for inspiration is not only kind of a joke, but it is extremely harmful. And by the way, this goes on inside of companies as well. It, first of all, it turns leadership and, and leadership writing and speaking and whatever into a form of lay preaching because now we're into inspiring people. If you were to read Sigmund Freud's Delusion and Dream and compare his discussion of the origins and functions of religion to those of the leadership industry, the parallels are, of course, quite striking. And the problem, the real problem with inspiration, I want to be inspired. The, the, so if I wanted to be inspired in medicine, I would take, well, you know, most people die of pancreatic cancer in a year and the five-year survival rate is close to zero. But somebody, I'm sure there is somebody, who would have survived by, you know, and this distribution is always somebody at the tail. So let's find this wonderful, inspiring person, put them in front of an audience and give an inspirational talk about surviving pancreatic cancer, which, by the way, will do nothing to improve the finding of a cure for cancer, the treatment of cancer for anybody in the audience, but it's kind of inspiring. Um, so the search for inspiration drives the use of rare and unusual examples. And, that's, and, and you see this all the time. So one of my good friends who's endorsed this book, Jim Collins, wrote a book called Good to Great. You read Good to Great, he started off with 1,400 companies, as I recall, somewhere between 10 and 15, maybe 11 or 14, made the transition. So if you were a betting man, you would not make, you would not, you would not make that bet. I mean, the rare unusual examples are interesting, but they don't really inform a lot about what we should do. And secondly, the search for inspiration uh, leads to the reconstruction and misremembering of events uh, to produce an uplifting, inspiring narrative. Uh, the book, which was made into a movie, Lone Survivor, of the poor guy who survived out of the 16 Marines dumped into Afghanistan. Uh, it turned out to be quite inspiring. Also turned out that the more they looked at it and talked uh, to other people, turned out to not be completely true. Inspiration has another problem. It is a horrible way to accomplish change. Um, it sets unrealistic expectations for ourselves and others. It raises motivation, but only for a short time. Many of the inspirational stories you hear, I would say all of them, so when you hear some inspirational story about some fabulous CEO, do about 30 minutes of due diligence, and my bet will be you'll find that a good portion of what you've heard is incorrect. 
And by the way, we know how to accomplish behavioral change. If you have a drug problem, a smoking problem, an eating problem, uh, and a problem with alcohol, all of these uh, interventions to change your behavior with respect to food, drink, or, or illegal drugs, or for that matter, legal drugs, all understand several principles. Number one, your behavior is a function of the social environment in which you are. So you're much more likely to drink if you're surrounded by drinkers, much more likely to smoke if you're surrounded by smokers, much more likely to gamble if you're surrounded by gamblers, you get the point. And therefore, one of the first things these intervention programs do is, I'm going to separate you from the people who are engaging in the behavior that we want you to stop. So we need to worry about that. Secondly, we understand the importance of measurement. In the words of the quality movement, that gets, that gets measured gets done. So that goes back to the measurement thing we've talked about. We also know the importance of visual priming. It's how casinos and retail stores work. It is why Brian Wansink, this famous guy who's written a book about dieting, says the best way to lose weight is serve your portions on smaller plates, because large plates cue you to eat more. <coughs> so instead of worrying about inspiring people, if we worried about measuring priming giving people reminders of what they should do, should do and not do, uh, we would be in much, much, much better shape. So the recommendations that follow from this is to do due diligence on leaders so that you know that the stories are true. Stop at chasing inspiration. You need facts, not fables. And understand the pitfalls of trying to learn from rare events and extreme examples. They can be instructive, but you know, you look, see that the great 14 people, 14 companies make the transition. To me, the interesting question is, what about the common sense things that Collins recommends is so difficult to do? Could it make them rare? And how could you make them easier? Okay. Next, we're going to talk about a trade-off, ends versus means. Everybody wants to do great things, but they want to do it in nice ways. New York Times, June 15th, 2014. Where dishonesty is best policy, U.S. soccer falls short. Turns out you want to win soccer games, you have to able to fake injuries. Just, I just watched the, uh, the, the match between Rio, uh, uh, Real Madrid and Atletico, you know, and you can see them, you know, somebody touches somebody, ah, oh, they fall on the floor, whatever. Anyway, the article asks the questions, are Americans bad at play acting, and if so, should they try to get better? Gamesmanship and embellishment are part of high-level soccer. Players exaggerate contact. They turn niggling knocks into something closer to grim death. You can add, by the way, take that and substitute a few words. Are Americans bad at play acting and so should they try to get better? Gamesmanship and embellishment are part not only of high-level soccer, they're part of organizational life. Uh, people exaggerate the amount of work they do. They turn, you know, niggling projects into things that, you know, are huge accomplishments. So um, an interesting issue. Uh, many of the most celebrated leaders engaged in behaviors and use strategies I'm willing to bet are completely outside of almost what, what virtually every leadership development program teaches. So everybody says, I want you to be a great leader like Abraham Lincoln, but nobody's going to teach you to be like Abraham Lincoln. You go watch Lincoln, the fabulous movie, what did Lincoln do? Lincoln lied about his intention to free the slaves at the start of his political career. Lincoln lied about whether the Southern where the Southern delegation was when, uh, when he was trying to end the war. Lincoln, in order to pass the 13th Amendment and outlawed slavery, was willing to basically go down to the floor or send his emissaries in, into Congress and trade positions, basically sell positions for votes. None of this is like in any leadership program you would read about. Nelson Mandela, completely inconsistent. One day, a raging communist and a proposer of violence, and sometimes later, a peace person interested in capitalism. Uh, you can go down the list. All of these people. Uh, were willing because they were so committed to accomplish uh, to, to accomplishing something. They were willing to do whatever it took. So if I have to, you know, tell you a little story, if I have to not tell you what I'm really going to do, if I have to um, say one thing one day and a different thing the other, I'm willing to do that in order to accomplish this major change that I'm trying to get done. 
This is a wonderful thing, which I would urge you to read on your own. It's why Machiavelli still matters from an article of opinion piece in the New York Times, December 9, 2013. I would highlight only one sentence, um, which is, Machiavelli teaches that in a world where so many are not good, you must learn to be able to not be good. Um, and then the proper aim of a leader is to maintain his state and not incidentally his job. There are never easy choices, and prudence consists of knowing how to recognize the qualities of the hard decisions you face and choosing the less bad as what is the most good. So this, the kumbaya nature of the leadership industry and the kumbaya, which I just find now not only offensive, but completely unhelpful to what we're trying to accomplish in, in, in making leaders effective. I just find it just uh, the, the distressing and not helpful. Because if I tell you know, so I tell you, we have students from Stanford, believe it or not, go out into the world. I believe in open and trans openness and transparency. Not a problem. What happened? Well, you know, I'm on the phone with you because I'm about to get fired. Why? I told my boss what I thought of her. <laughs> not a good thing to do, <laughs> unless your opinion is pretty high. So, you know, I mean, we're sending people out and they are and they are losing their jobs or they're having career setbacks, and I find that, you know, just really hallucious, but whatever. Perhaps the biggest problem of all in this leadership world is the confusion between what should be and what is. In the leadership domain, we have a big discrepancy with how we believe leaders ought to be. Leaders ought to be honest and open and transparent and tell the truth and look out for the well-being of others. And, by the way, there's a lot of research that suggests if leaders did that, the workplaces would be better, the employees would be happier, their engagement levels would be higher, people wouldn't be saying on the parade survey, I'd you know, give up a substantial raise to get rid of my boss, et cetera, et cetera. And then we need to look at how leaders actually are, understand that discrepancy, and understand why it exists. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples, but these can be fixed as well. And the two questions to ask about the awful title leadership attributes is there any evidence that most or many leaders display <laughs> the desired behaviors? And since they don't, what is the logic for the opposite? And by the way, you can play this game out as you look at the current political campaign, since the leading candidates, for the most part, bear almost no resemblance uh, to what we claim leaders should be or do. One example is modesty. Here we go. That is, in fact, the chapter in which, in a book written more than two and a half years ago, the name Donald Trump appears. So Jim, Jim Collins, in good to great, highlighted level five leaders who were characterized as being both driven but also incredibly modest. So you didn't see their names all over the news media and whatever. Modesty is, of course, a virtue. And most importantly, modest leaders share credit with others. And the sharing of credit with other people is more likely to attract other people because people are more likely to work on a project for which they get some credit. And secondly, people are more likely to work on a pro pro project for which other people listen to them. Um, and, it, and, and thirdly, uh, when people give you credit, you feel better about yourself. So modesty is, is, is a good thing to do. But in a book called, written called The Productive Narcissist, Narcissist, written by Michael Maccabee, he noted that many of the most venerated business leaders exhibited high levels of narcissism. Steve Jobs, Jack Wells, Larry Ellison, Donald Trump, in a book that was written 20 years ago, so the person doesn't change, Michael Eisner, and a bunch of others. And we know from research on narcissism that many, many, many studies, and you can look at this up on scholar.google.com, which accesses the scholarly literature, and look at the effects of, put in a phrase, the effects of narcissism, and you'll show, that what you'll find is that many studies show that immodesty, self-promotion, self-aggrandizement, and unwarranted self-confidence reliably helps people attain leadership positions in the first place, then once in them, affects their ability to hold on to those positions, get higher pay, and even helps in some dimensions, though not all, of group and organizational performance. And we, so if we want modest leaders, we need to understand, number one, why are we selecting for the opposite? And number two, you know, what about Im immodesty is helping people, and how are there other ways uh, to accomplish that or to build organizations where these qualities don't have the same positive effects that they currently do. Second example would be authenticity. There's a big authentic leadership movement written, represented by Bill George's book, uh, True North, written with my colleague and former MBA student Pete Sims. The idea is that people ought to be true to their real inner thoughts and feelings, to their inner character, 
that you need to be true to yourself. And then if you're not true to yourself and put on a show or put on an act, people can see through attempts at deception. Um, and by the way, people prefer to relate to people who are authentic. Great leaders are great actors. Um, and by the way, if you believe you can see through people who are putting on a show, good luck. There's been a bunch of empirical literature on this. People are very bad at uncovering lies, even when they're told to do so and they're told that some of the people that are talking to them are lying. And all you need to do is look at the Bernie Madoff uh, financial scandal or many of these other things. We believe what we want to believe and we're quite bad at uncovering deception. Authenticity itself may be impossible because it says be true to your true self, but that, what true self is that? Uh, is it true to your managerial self, your, to yourself as a parent, yourself as a, as, as a child, yourself as a, you know, yourself in various relationships? We occupy in our lives numerous roles, and in each one of these roles we have to do and be slightly different things. Um, and authenticity is about being true to your inner self, but leaders need to be true not to themselves, but to what the people in their work setting want and need from them. So when Gary Loveman, who at the time was running uh, Harrah's, which then became Caesar's, the big casino company, came to my class, and for the first time in 2004, after I had written a case on him, he arrived, he did a great job. It was only at lunch that I learned that Gary Loveman had the flu and was running on a temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as a sentient human being, the last thing Gary Loveman wants to do if he's being true to himself is show up in my class sick as a dog and spend two sessions, you know, talking to these students who, who he doesn't know. But he understands that part of his deal is, he's agreed to do this, so I'd have let him off the hook, but part of his deal is he has the capacity to. I feel like hell, doesn't matter. I'm with employees who will see me once a year. I have to look energized, engaged, concerned, even if my daughter is giving me trouble, even if there are marital issues, even if I'm tired beyond comprehension, leaders need to be authentic and true to what the people around them want and need from them. My second example would be Allison Davis Blake. I like to say I knew Allison Davis Blake before she was hyphenated. When Allison Davis was a doctoral, Davis was a doctoral student at the Stanford Business School, she was smart, nice, decent, the most painfully shy human being I have ever encountered in the world. If she spoke in class, which she almost never did, you couldn't hear her. Allison Davis Blake is stepping down this year as the dean of the Roth School of the University of Michigan, one of the leading business schools in the world. She told me a couple weeks ago that she is the finalist, one of two, for a provost position in one of the top 50 universities in the United States. You do not get from where she was to where she is by being the shyest person in the room, some person that no one can hear. The idea that Allison Davis Blake should have been true to the original Allison, uh, who couldn't talk, who had no, or exhibited no self-confidence, is just, I think, nuts. People remake themselves all the time, and if you're gonna want to be successful, you have to. So let me give you some final recommendations, and we will, then we'll have lots of time for questions, because on my computer it says it's only 10.38, and I was supposed to go to approximately 10.40. How do you like that? Just on time. My bosses here are always pleased. Um, the, not that I should do a good job, but you should do a good job on time. That's even more important. So if you want to improve, I think, if, if, if we're serious about making leadership better than it's been in the past. I think the first thing we need to do is both understand and then maybe remedy the disconnects between what leaders say and what they do. Lots of leaders talk about doing all kinds of things. Many of them don't do it. You know, I'm nice, I'm whatever, they self-advertise they self the wonderful qualities they display and then you go talk to them and you hear pretty much the opposite. We need to worry about and do something about the disconnect between prescriptions for leaders and the reality of actual leaders' uh, behaviors and traits. I think one of the big problems in leadership today is that we tell people to do things that while they are aspirational and great in many respects, are so discrepant 
with what we know about fundamental human psychology and leader behavior, that we're basically, it's like going to church. You know, we're telling you to be this person that nobody's going to be. Uh, and so it's kind of an interesting disconnect that we need to remedy. Uh, we need certainly to remedy the disconnect between leader performance and what happens to those leaders, the fact that many of them have no consequences for their bad behavior, which goes on all the time. Uh, we also need to remedy the disconnect between what most people seem to want, which is uplifting stories uh, about relatively rare events, and what I think most people need. I tell you, you know, one of the reasons why medicine, I believe, has made much more progress than management is that medicine is much more science-based. So when you show me lots of people dying of pancreatic cancer, I'm not going to find the one that doesn't, you know, make this person into some role model. I'm not going to say, wow, the death rate for pancreatic cancer I find depressing. I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's unacceptable, but it's not depressing. It, it, it is what it is. If you're going to make it better, you've got to understand why it is and how to make it better. You're going to evaluate your interventions in terms of whether or not uh, they generate improvement. This idea that you ought to be in the inspiration business is crazy. And then I finally, and perhaps most importantly, we need to evaluate leadership development programs uh, by their actual effects on, um, on, on human beings. On, on what they do, um, on how they do it, on their, um, on their own leadership, on, on, you know, on, the, on employee engagement. On, we, need to, we need to have a much more uh, evaluation system that, that, that evaluates something other whether or not we had a nice time and liked the donuts. So that's the end of my formal presentation. It is on time by my schedule. And so we will now let you ask questions or make comments or do anything else you want. I very much appreciate the wonderful high attendance, and I hope you will all take this message extremely seriously and not say, well, this was depressing, <laughs> a word that I don't really believe we should use. All right, so uh, thank you, Jeffrey, for the really wonderful presentation and for being on time. And I will take a few minutes now to uh, ask, there have been many, many questions that have been coming in, so we'll do our best to answer, to answer some of them. Um, and so, Jeffrey, one of, the first, one of the questions that came in was uh, related to the, this theme of gamesmanship and being authentic to not to yourself but to the people around you. What are some ways that you found that you can understand what the others around you are wanting you to be? Uh, well, you do, I think you need to develop the skill of empathic understanding, and that is, number one, you need to listen, and number two, you need to understand what their, um, what their perspective is from what they're, how they're being paid, how they're being evaluated, what their educational background is. Uh, so a combination of what are their key performance indicators, what are they trying to get done, and they may, man, they may not tr be trying to get done what you're trying to get done. So to take the simple example, of my poor Gary Loveman coming to my class, Gary Loveman understands, I mean intuitively, because he understands the situation, that students in the class expect to see him. They expect to see him and they expect to be able to engage with him with energy and, and intensity. And just because he's running a 101 degree fever and doesn't feel well, uh, their expectations have not changed. So I, so I think in, in almost every situation we can uh, figure out how are people getting paid and rewarded, what are their professional backgrounds, what, what do they say about what they want out of the situation, and then try to, as a leader, uh, understand that as you, as you put together how you want to present yourself. Um, one, one question that came up that I found interesting was around the theme of when we speak about training, we often think about um, athletes that train, and we often, there are some programs that use coaches or athletic coaches uh, that come to speak about leadership. Athletes uh, have a very, uh, a very strong drive to become better athletes. How about leaders going to these programs? What are your thoughts on their own motivation to become better leaders? That's a fabulously fantastic question because in many instances, uh, I think the individual leaders who are sent to these programs uh, are often often see them as kind of a check the box activity. You know, my company my company's sending me. I want to go. It's better than working. You know, they may send you to a nice resort. You get good food. You hear somebody who doesn't challenge you too much, and it's pretty entertaining. So uh, I, I think I think the difference between an athlete uh, who is you know, really, very, by the way, there's another difference, which the athlete has come to, to specifically develop 
a very, 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 very specific and measurable skill. Whether it's throwing a football, or jumping, or swimming, or running, or running a certain distance, or running at a certain speed, and, and the evaluation of the coaching is done. So I go to a coach at the end of the, the, the day, I'm no better doing whatever I went to the coach for, the coach has failed, regardless of how entertaining and inspiring and et cetera they've been. So uh, the, uh, the ninth analogy with the athlete for me is not only whether or not the athlete is self-motivated, but also whether or not the coaching or the training is, is very behaviorally focused. And in athletes it is, and in leadership it often is not. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting and kind of ties to, to, your, to, uh, to your sense of medicine as a scientific approach where leadership is not. Have you, uh, do you have any examples of places where uh, this measurement of leadership achievement or success has been successful, where, where, where organizations have been successful at doing that? Sure. There are not many, but there are a few. I think, you know, DaVita, which is a kidney dialysis company now called DaVita Healthcare because they've expanded into the primary health area is a place where their, their operating culture is no brag, just facts. And so they are an extremely fact-based place. Um, I can recall their CEO telling me a story about somebody who he hired to be in charge of their Redwoods program, which is a leadership development program. Um, and uh, they have people who, have, who are nurses and have uh, worked up through the ranks as a nurse manager. And they have people who come in as MBAs. And he noticed that the people in the program were mostly the MBAs. And he said to the guy running the program, you know, you need uh, to have equal opportunity in this program for the nurses because we want a balanced set of leaders between, uh, you know, between the nurses and the people with business school degrees. And about six months later, he went back and sat down with the guy. And he said, he said, have you fixed the problem? And the guy looked at the data and he said, no. And Kemp looked at him and he said, you understand what that means? And the guy says, yes. He says, I have to leave. So it literally, I mean, the numbers are so explicit and the goals are so explicit, the people, when they don't do it, they fire themselves. So, so yes, I say there are companies. I mean, DaVita measures adherence to values. DaVita measures employee engagement. Um, so you have to make, to make these measures, you have to take them seriously. And uh, they would be one example. Right. Um, there's a question here about women and how they can differentiate and become better leaders. So some of the traits that you mentioned are perhaps not uh, very compatible with, with the way women uh, behave or may perceive themselves. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, sure, which will be quite controversial. Uh, or not. I mean, if you read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, I mean, her basic advice is do the best you can and not carry all this psychological baggage with you. Uh, when I, I, I can, I mean, Allison Davis Blake can give you instance after instance in which uh, because she is a woman and looks, by the way, younger than her age, um, she's had all kinds of assumptions made about her and all kinds of other stuff has gone on. And Allison's response to that has been to say, basically, women have to be twice as good to get half the rewards, but fortunately we are. Get over it. The world is not a just and fair place. Don't carry the baggage with you. And it's, I think, one of the things that has made her successful. The ability, you know, I mean, she, she often proactively gets justice for herself. I can tell you a story about that if you're interested. But, uh, but, but in many instances, this is just about, yes, this happened. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm not going to let it emotionally affect me. I'm basically going to let it roll off and just continue to do what I think I need to do and be what I need to be and not get, I, so I think men or women, I don't care who you are. If you ask me what is a critical characteristic to be successful in life, let alone in the forms of life that we're talking about, persistence and resilience. I mean, you know, Venus Williams, Serena Williams, they'll win all the tenor ma tennis matches. Um, the life is tough. The higher you go, the more competitive it's going to be. You have to be willing to, you know, you have to be willing in the boxing terms to be able to take a punch. You have to be able to knock down and get and get back up. And the one, the people that, if you look and think about it, who have been the most persistent and resilient, um, I think, succeed. So Willie Brown, the most powerful African American politician in the United States, mayor of San Francisco twice, uh, speaker of the California Assembly for 14 years, lost his first race for the Assembly, lost his first race for the speakership. Um, you, have to, you have to be able to survive the setbacks and the stuff that people throw at you. Mm -hmm. 
So, so I mean, in that you also answered some questions that came in. We're just asking about what are what are some of the key leadership traits in your mind, uh, and perhaps those would be, would be persistence and resilience. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that list? I would say resistance and persistence, resilience and persistence for sure, and pa the ability to read other people, not necessarily for their benefit, but the ability to know where other people are coming from. That would be another. A fourth, which people underestimate, is the effect of energy. And emotions are contagious, energy is contagious. Everybody in this room, everybody who's listening to this podcast understands that when you're around a boss or colleagues who are fast and got lots of energy and excitement, it rubs off on you. And when you're around people who are down, it rubs off. So, so energy, the ability to work with less sleep. I mean, the ability to have a lot of, a lot of intensity uh, to what you do. Uh, brings, I think, something. And the fifth thing I would talk about is the ability, I, 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 in the book I talk about it, in the power book I talk about it as, a, as, a, as the ability to um, uh, tolerate conflict. It, but it's more than that. It's the ability to not be liked. So I have a friend who I talk about a lot in the power book who's just been named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, a woman who's changing in medicine and treats breast cancer very successfully. And, um, you know, I was at a meeting with her once, and she's tough. It's a little nicer now than she used to be, but tough and not very patient. And somebody said, I, well, you know, Laura, you know, Laura Esterman, he says, well, you know, Laura, I don't like your personality. And, you know, she said, when 45,000 women a year are not dying of breast cancer, we can talk about my personality. And until then, shut then she used some expletive up. <laughs> you know, the point being that, you know, I mean, you can't, if you're trying to, if you're trying to achieve important changes and do things that nobody else has done before, uh, you will almost invariably upset somebody because the people, the status quo remains the status quo because people have interests in it remaining the status quo. And so you're going to change it. People are going to get upset. You can't let it worry you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So one, one other question is around leaders uh, who are focused on their personal success versus their organizational success. This perhaps ties into the incentive question. How can uh, organizations perhaps channel that, you know, uh, personal success drive of, of leaders to their benefit? Well, it is. The, the, the topic of incentive alignment would take us a whole other hour to talk about. But I, let me suggest that when you see individuals acting, in their own selfish self-interest and against the interest of the organization, besides blaming the individual and hoping somehow you're going to get rid of that person and bring in somebody else who's going to be different, you really need to understand that is a systems problem. That the organization is producing that behavior. You want the behavior to change. You need to change the environment in which that person is working. You need to change the cultural messages. You probably need to change the incentives. You probably need to change what's cueing that individual. Maybe you need to change the person that the individual is reporting to. Because oftentimes we say, well, you know, this person is acting like blah, blah, blah. How is that individual's boss acting? Often the same way. We're modeling the behavior. So we can't just say, oh, they're a bad person. We need to do something about that individual. We need to look at the forces, the messages that are getting sent that are reinforcing that behavior. So perhaps in closing, one last question. Um, this whole uh, hour we've been talking about leaders. Is there any advice that you would give to followers? Become leaders. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, yeah, we live in a hierarchical world. The evidence is clear in a book by, by, written by the British, epidemiolo uh, British epidemiologist, Sir Michael Marmot. Health follows the status gradient. The more education, the more wealth, the higher your position, the longer you're likely to live. So um, yes, I think you know people in a in a hierarchical world in which there's income inequality, there's health inequality, there's access to everything is is, is reasonably unequal. Uh, you need to decide where you want to be in that distribution. But if you want to be at the top, then you should go for it. The leaders, by the way, are not born; they are made. Everything that we have talked about today and a bunch of stuff we haven't talked about today are skills that can be learned. And I think Allison. You know, one of the reasons why I'm so thrilled by Allison in her, in her career and where she's gone and how successful she's been is, is, is that she provides, I think, the case, a case illustration of the point that, you know, I mean, if, if Allison, they were painfully shy. The word painfully shy was probably written, uh, the phrase, about her. And if she can go from that uh, to being able to give talks in front of hundreds of people and you know, the senior corporate executives and, be, you know, be 
the finalists in a big deal provost search and get offered university presidencies and other deanships all the time. Um, this is something, this, this is a personal, this is, this is a, a journey of personal transformation and growth, but it is a journey and everybody's journey obviously is going to be distinct, but everyone can make their own journey to, to, to become what they want to become. Uh, I want to thank Jeffrey Pfeffer again for this really uh, insightful presentation, uh, and I wish all of you a very good day. Thank you.